test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between two students about buying a used car. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to six. Hello. Hello. Can I speak to Eleanor, please? This is Eleanor speaking. Hi. My name is Jan. I'm calling about the car that was advertised on the notice board in the student union building. Is it still for sale? Yes, it is. Your ad says it's a 1985 Celica, in good condition. It's old, but it has been well looked after. My family has had the car for ten years. I'm just the third owner, and my mother had it before me, so we know its history. We've got all the receipts and records. It's had regular maintenance, and the brakes were done last year. It runs really well, but looks its age. Why are you selling it, by the way? Well, I'm going overseas next month to study. I'll be away for at least two years, so I have to sell it. Unfortunately, it's been a good car. You want fifteen hundred dollars? Is that right? I was asking two thousand dollars, but since I need to sell it quickly, I've reduced the price. Would you like to come and take it for a drive? I don't live far from the university. Yes, I'd like to have a look. What time would suit you? Any time this evening is fine. Um. Well, I finish classes at six o'clock. How about straight after that? Say six thirty. Great. I'll give you directions. When you leave the main gate of the university, turn left on South Road and keep going until you get to the Grand Cinema. Take the first right. That's Princess Street. I'm at number eighty-eight on the right. So it's eighty Princess Street. No, it's eighty-eight Princess Street, and the suburb is Parkwood. You'll see the car parked in front. It's the red one with the for sale sign on it. Okay. Thanks, Eleanor. I'll see you later. Bye. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Later that day, at the university, Jan meets up with her friend Sam, and tells him about the car. Hi, Sam. Hey, Jan. What's happening? I'm glad I ran into you. I've decided I have to get a car. You're going to buy a car? Do you really need one? I'd probably still be driving, except that my car broke down last year. Instead of getting another one, I just moved closer to the university and went back to riding a bike. Better for the environment, better for my health, and I save a lot of money. Did it really cost that much? Well, when you think of registration, insurance, rising petrol costs, parking plus maintenance and repairs, it adds up.、Mm, I know it's going to be expensive, but I really need my own transportation. It takes half an hour by bus each way to university, as it is. But now I'm working at night in the city. There's no way I want to hang around waiting for a bus late at night, then walk three blocks home alone. Hey, I think you've got a point there. So, what kind of car are you looking at? It's an eighty-five Celica, same kind as I used to have. The owner's asking fifteen hundred dollars. That's pretty old. How many kilometres has it done? You know, I forgot to ask. I'll have to check tonight when I go to see it. Would you be able to come with me to have a look at about six thirty? Sure, I'll come. 
But I don't know a lot about cars. I do know one thing, though. I wouldn't buy an old car without having a mechanic look at it first. That's a good idea. But won't it cost a lot? Not really. You can get a check done through the Automobile Association for $80, and it comes with a report on the condition of the car. It can save you a lot of money in the long run. I'll keep that in mind. So we have to get to Parkwood at 6.30. Do you want to take the bus? It goes straight down South Road every 15 minutes. Or maybe we could walk. I don't think it's that far. Actually, I could borrow my roommate's motorbike for an hour or so. He's working all evening in the library. Do you think he'd mind? No way. He owes me a favour or two. OK, great. See you at six, outside the student centre. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Section two. You are going to hear a lecture about dining services. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to the Dining Commons. This is the newest facility on campus, and I am proud to say also one of the best. I know that all university students miss eating home-cooked food. Well, this year, we are hoping to provide students with food and services that will make you feel at home, even without your family. The administration has been listening to the voice of the students. Students gave us frequent suggestions last year as to how we could improve the university. One of the most frequent suggestions was improving the dining options. We have been working hard all summer to come up with ideas that will make student life in the dormitories more pleasant. One of the new options we are offering in the dining facilities is variety in student meals. Last year, there was a set menu for every dinner, so if students didn't like the food, there was no choice. Students had to eat whatever was served. But this new dining facility has three completely unique areas, each with a different theme. At every meal, there will be three options for students to choose from. For example, there might be Italian food at station number one, which might consist of pizza and pasta. At station number two, there would be American food, consisting of hamburgers and hot dogs. At station number three, there could be vegetarian soups and salads, accommodating all the vegetarians. We hope that with the greater selection of food, all students will find something to their liking. Now look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 15 to 20. Not only will students have more options, the food will also be better. Each section of the facility will have a head chef. These are real chefs that have been trained in culinary school and have been hired specifically by the school to work in the dining facilities. All of the chefs have a speciality. The school is hoping that these chefs will prepare better tasting and more nutritious food. Every student will be able to make suggestions and also give their input 
as to which menus taste better. Last year, many students complained that the dining facilities didn't have very convenient hours. This year, we hope to change that. We will open for breakfast at 6am to accommodate all the early risers. In the evenings, we will open until midnight for all the students that like to go for a late night snack. The afternoons will still remain closed, but we will have a student store open that will provide all students with drinks and fruit. The student store will be open every day from 2pm to 5pm. Every student that has paid full tuition and dormitory fees has already paid for their dining facility fees. Students can eat at any time and in any amount for free. If you are a student that does not live in a dormitory, you can still purchase a dining facility card. This card will entitle you to the full services of the dining facility. This card is available only for students and is not open to the general public. If you are not a student and wish to dine here, you must purchase meals at the door. There are a few rules to follow. Even though we do not limit the amount of food that can be taken, we do not want students to waste food. Please do not take more than you can eat. Also, every student must clean his or her own trays and plates. We will provide plates and trays for student use, but please do not abuse these items. Please do not leave your plates on the tables. Your parents are not here to clean up after you anymore, so I hope all students will be responsible. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the upcoming year. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 26. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for 20 years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university? even with the change in your everyday duties. I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? 
Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television program last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon, then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip, Professor Nitik. Could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> An average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon, and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of two thousand and one. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on William Kidd. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. A pirate story, William Kidd. William Kidd, who is better known by the name Captain Kidd, was a seventeenth-century British privateer 
and semi-legendary pirate who became celebrated in English literature as one of the most colourful outlaws of all time. Fortune seekers have hunted his buried treasure in vain through succeeding centuries. Kidd's early career is obscure. It is believed he went to sea as a youth. After 1689, he was sailing as a legitimate privateer for Great Britain against the French in the West Indies and off the coast of North America. In 1690, he was an established sea captain and ship owner in New York City, where he owned property. At various times, he was dispatched by both New York and Massachusetts to rid the coast of enemy privateers. In London in 1695, he received a royal commission to apprehend pirates who molested the ships of the East India Company in the Red Sea and in the Indian Ocean. Kidd sailed from Deptford on his ship, the Adventure Galley, on February 27, 1696, called at Plymouth and arrived at New York City on July 4 to take on more men. Avoiding the normal pirate haunts, he arrived by February 1697 at the Comoro Islands off East Africa. It was apparently some time after his arrival there that Kidd, still without having taken a prize ship, decided to turn to piracy. In August 1697, he made an unsuccessful attack on ships sailing with mocha coffee from Yemen, but later took several small ships. His refusal two months later to attack a Dutch ship nearly brought his crew to mutiny, and in an angry exchange, Kidd mortally wounded his gunner, William Moore. Kidd took his most valuable prize, the Armenian ship Queda Merchant, in January 1698, and scuttled his own unseaworthy adventure galley. When he reached Anguilla in the West Indies, April 1699, he learnt that he had been denounced as a pirate. He left the Queda Merchant at the island of Hispaniola, where the ship was possibly scuttled. In any case, it disappeared with its questionable booty and sailed in a newly purchased ship, the Antonio, to New York City, where he tried to persuade the Earl of Bellamont, then colonial governor of New York, of his innocence. Bellamont, however, sent him to England for trial, and he was found guilty, May 8th and 9th, 1701, of the murder of Moore and on five indictments of piracy. Important evidence concerning two of the piracy cases was suppressed at the trial, and some observers later questioned whether the evidence was sufficient for a guilty verdict. Kidd was hanged, and some of his treasure was recovered from Gardiner's Island off Long Island. Proceeds from his effects and goods taken from the Antonio were donated to charity. In years that followed, the name of Captain Kidd has become inseparable from the romanticised concept of the swashbuckling pirate of Western fiction. Among other stories concerning caches of treasure he supposedly buried is Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.